So, so I'm very pleased to um, to do it, to have here uh, Alessandro Forte. We we met uh, with Alessandro a long time ago, and uh, I'm uh, Alessandro is very often in Paris because he's both in uh, he's in several places. He's in the University of Florida, he's in uh, Montreal, and he's also in at uh, Institut Physique du Globe in Paris, where he has a lot of collaboration. And uh, his, uh, the, the work I know of him the most is his work on the mental convection and the derivation of the change of momentum of inertia of the Earth related to the mental convection. And this has some important implication because uh, as it changed the momentum of inertia, it changed the rotation of the Earth and it changed as well the precession frequency which is what we are looking for when going into the past. And um, so in the present talk, uh, I assume Alessandro will uh, go deeper in that and we will give us uh, an account of his uh, recent work with his co-workers on uh, accurate computations on the past history of um, of mental convection and the computation of this elliptical figure of the Earth. So thank you for that, Alessandro, and you can uh, share your screen now. Well, thank you once again then for the introduction, Jack, and thanks to everybody who could uh, share in the discussion today. Um, Jack mentioned that this is a, a collaborative effort and in, indeed it is. I'd like to acknowledge uh, two individuals in particular who've been a critical part of the work that I'll be talking about today. Uh, in particular, Marie, Marie Kalyan, uh, who's a PhD student working with me at the University of Florida. And uh, of course, Petar Glishovich, who's been a longtime collaborator and deeply involved with this work. And uh, and without their contributions, Marie and Petars, it would be fair to say that most of this work would not be possible. So I would like to underline that it's really a multidisciplinary effort that requires expertise from multiple fields. It's, it's quite daunting. And this work has developed over the course, as, as Jacques himself even already intimated, over actually decades of effort to put all of these ingredients together. And it's exciting time because the, finally the results have matured and the techniques have matured and we've made enormous progress even over just the last few years. And I will therefore take you into a kind of a journey, uh, both in time to the origins of this work and also in space deep inside the planet and then uh, move back up to the surface and ultimately, shall we say, into outer space really, when we look at the behavior of the planet as it rotates. So it's, um, it's an ambitious discussion. I will try to uh, be as efficient as I can to go through it. Uh, of course, if there are questions, um, uh, you might perhaps interrupt me if the question is particularly uh, pressing. Otherwise, I'm very happy, of course, at the end to take any questions. So without further ado, let me jump into the, our discussion then, which is a discussion of the Earth's internal dynamics and how that dynamics is reflected in the external gravitational form of our planet. And in particular, we'll be looking at the ellipsoidal shape of our planet and how that reflects the dynamics deep inside. Um, so when we speak about internal dynamics, we can uh, try to understand the impact of that dynamics as shown here in this cartoon image of, a, of an upwelling mantle plume. Uh, mantle convection is, this is one half of what we would call the mantle convection system. The other half involves the return flow of cold material from the surface down into the interior process that's called subduction. Um, this particular half here and, and the subduction both involve transport of mass and heat across the depth of the mantle. And this is, of course, the mechanism by which the planet as a whole is cooling over time. So the, the secular cooling of our planet since accretion has been accomplished through this very efficient process called mantle convection. These anomalies inside the mantle which drive the flow um, 
have multiple impacts on surface geological processes that we can directly measure. In particular, in the case of this upwelling, for example, we see that it induces an upward flow that will displace the surface of the solid surface of our planet upwards. So mantle convection will produce something called dynamic topography at the surface of our planet. The flow in the interior is coupled to the movement of the tectonic plates. And so those plate motions are, again, a direct reflection of the movements deep inside our planet. The anomalies of these uh, upwelling structures and downwellings, which are not shown here, those density anomalies also perturb the gravity field of the Earth. Uh, and we can visualize those perturbations either in terms of something called the geoid field, which we'll look at in a few moments, or uh, another representation, uh, which are freer gravity anomalies. And of course, these can now be accurately measured nowadays with orbiting satellites. Uh, so we have multiple manifestations, including at the core mantle boundary. There are efforts underway, and there have been over many years, to try to directly constrain the amplitude of these bumps at the core mantle boundary, something we would call dynamic core mantle boundary topography. All of these are signatures that we would like to measure as accurately as possible in an effort to understand what is actually going on inside of the Earth's interior, in particular, the actual spatial distribution and the magnitude of the anomalies associated with mantle convection. And we'll be focusing in this talk in particular on the geoid or the gravitational perturbations generated by this internal dynamics. So in summary then, if we generate a model of the dynamics of the Earth's interior, if that model is successful, uh, then that model should be able to explain as closely as, as possible, ideally perfectly if possible, these surface manifestations of the internal dynamics. And one of them, of course, as I mentioned, are the gravity anomalies measured by orbiting satellites shown here. These are long wavelength gravity anomalies, which in this case are shown up to spherical harmonic degree 32. The dynamic topography on our planet also provide constraints on that dynamics. This is, um, uh, again, the displacements of the solid surface due to the buoyancy distribution in the Earth's interior. That dynamic topography is not directly observed. We actually have to remove the effect of the Earth's crust. That's not a small correction, that has, but it is one that can be made to reveal, ultimately, uh, the distribution of forces inside the mantle. And of course, this most perhaps recognizable and spectacular manifestation of the dynamics is provided by the movements of the tectonic plates themselves. They also are a direct reflection of all the driving forces distributed inside the mantle. And finally, I spoke about the bumps at the core mantle boundary. And there's one particular aspect of that topography which is well constrained. This is called the excess flattening. This is the flattening of the core beyond that which is predicted just by the rotation of the Earth around its axis. This excess flattening has been constrained by VLBI data, uh, VLBI constraints, which are data which are able to place constraints on something called the free core notation. And the frequency of that free core notation is sensitive to this excess ellipticity. And it actually turns out to be a remarkably tight constraint on the ellipticity of the core. Uh, this excess flattening, as it's determined by the VLBI data, has an error bound of the order of about 25%. That's remarkably small compared to other uncertainties, for example, in the global tomography models themselves. So this is a, a profoundly important constraint, on especially the dynamics of the mantle in the deep interior. So these are some of the data sets that we should try to fit before going much further in, in terms of investigating uh, the implications of the mantle convection models for, uh, let's say, the time-dependent behavior of the Earth. We'll come back to this in a few slides. So there are some ingredients that are required if we're going to construct these models of mantle dynamics. Obviously, we're going to need a mapping of the three-dimensional distribution of the density perturbations since these provide the buoyancy forces that drive the convection. And as we'll see, that mapping comes from seismic tomography. And we also need important information from mineral physics, such that we can convert these tomographic models precisely into density anomalies. 
um, there is uh, an, an important challenge in making this connection that I'll try to discuss as well. And of course, the other ingredient is we need uh, a description of the rheological structure of the rocks that constitute the mantle. And this rheology is generally represented in most of the mantle dynamic models in terms of a parameter called effective mantle viscosity. This is the effective viscosity of the solid material in the Earth's mantle. Uh, the, and it measures the creep resistance of the rocks to the imposition of very long-term forces, where those long-term forces are originate from buoyancy in the mantle. And these uh, viscosity uh, inferences can come from geodynamic data. Indeed, the very same data I showed you just in the preceding slide, that data is sensitive to the viscosity structure of the mantle, and they're very useful to constrain that structure. And once again, we can supplement those constraints with mineral physics data. And of course, we need appropriate surface boundary conditions. This will be another key aspect uh, in the construction of a mantle convection model. And of course, that has to therefore include the complexity of tectonic plates at the Earth's surface. That's, these provide a very important feedback on the dynamics in the Earth's interior. So seismic tomography, just as a quick reminder, of what, what is it and, and what does it accomplish? We have earthquakes, uh, primarily in subduction zones uh, on our planet. These earthquakes, each time an, an, a seismic event occurs, they liberate or generate seismic energy, which is shown here uh, traveling along rays as those as that energy travels through the Earth's interior from an earthquake to a seismic receiver at the Earth's surface, in other words, a seismometer, some of that energy will pass through anomalous regions in the Earth's interior where the speed of propagation of the seismic waves might be uh, enhanced, accelerated, or might be slowed down depending on the temperature, in particular, the temperature of these regions. And if we have enough earthquakes and enough seismometers and we accumulate data globally, we can then carry out a mathematical inverse problem. It's a tomographic inverse problem, which allows us to reconstruct the, redis the distribution of these anomalies from the, literally the top of the mantle right down to the core. And indeed, even inside the core, there's discussion of some heterogene heterogeneity in, within the Earth's core as well. Now, this technique requires um, an optimal distribution of seismic stations. And of course, in the Earth, that's less than optimal because most seismometers are on land, on continents. There has been some effort over the last few decades to have ocean bottom seismometers as well, but those are still few and far between. And as I said earlier, most of the earthquakes occur in subduction zones. So inevitably, there are going to be some gaps or regions in the Earth's interior that are not as perfectly sampled as we would like them to be. And this therefore brings to question whether there might be other data sets that can complement the seismic data in filling in those gaps. And we'll discuss what those other data can be. Now, seismic demography has made enormous progress. Uh, the, the subject, the field itself came into being essentially in the mid 1980s. The last few, the last decade has seen tremendous advances in the imaging of the Earth's interior, largely due to the enormous increase in seismic stations and, of course, the instruments themselves. They're, they're, the quality of those instruments has also in, in, increased in, incredibly over the last 10 years. But one of the things that has stood out and that has turned out to be a very robust aspect of all of the tomography models over the last 30 years is what we would call the large scale structure in the Earth's deep interior. And here I'm showing you in this animated image on the left, uh, a view of the long wavelength structure in the Earth's lower mantle as seen by one of the earlier tomography models. This is actually a model that I was involved with uh, nearly 30 years ago when I was a postdoc. And what we see in this rotating globe, by the way, there's no vertical exaggeration whatsoever. Everything is drawn to scale here. The Earth's surface is transparent. You see the outline of the continents and the plate boundaries. The core, the gray sphere is also drawn to scale. And 
all the heterogeneity in the upper mantle has been removed. Obviously, this is done with, on a computer so that we can look directly into the lower mantle. And what we see here at long wavelengths are these anomalies colored blue, which are the regions of the lower mantle where seismic waves travel faster. And mineral physics tells us that the reason for those waves to travel faster is that the temperatures of these parts of the mantle are anomalously low compared to the average mantle. So these are colder regions. And the red colored regions uh, are portions of the lower mantle where seismic waves travel slower. And once again, from mineral physics, we understand that that's due to hotter temperatures. And so what should be most apparent when you look at this image is this beautiful symmetry, um, essentially a, what we would call a quadrupolar symmetry, um, which is largely evidence of this dominance of spherical harmonic degree two structure in the lowermost mantle as seen through this seismic reconstruction of long wavelength structure. And that symmetry of lower mantle structure is also reflected in the corresponding distribution of gravity highs and lows that you see here in this map of the non-hydrostatic geoid as given by the GRACE satellite mission. The blue colors represent gravity lows and the red colors represent gravity highs where the, uh, there's an increased gravitational potential energy. The undulations of the geoid, you'll notice, are fairly modest. They're of the order of 100 meters. These are undulations with respect to the ellipsoidal, the hydrostatic ellipsoidal shape of the Earth. So these are undulations with respect to the shape that the Earth would have, the gravitational form of the Earth, if it were just a rotating ball of fluid at rest um, and rotating around its axis. So these undulations are remarkably small if you think about it. 100 meters relative to the mean radius of the ellipsoid is really a small number. And yet uh, these provide all the constraints that we require and precious constraints on the large scale dynamics in the Earth's interior. But one of the things that should, you should be perhaps struck by is that these regions in the lower mantle where we have an accumulation of colder material and therefore in principle denser material uh, these blue regions are essentially graveyards of subducted slabs which have entered the Earth's interior, uh, it's estimated perhaps 200 million years ago. Um, this graveyard of slabs, which are therefore intrinsically heavy, underlie uh, gravity lows at the Earth's surface. And of course, conversely, the regions which uh, are less uh, dense or more buoyant underlie gravity highs. So you have this anti-correlation. And of course, this anti-correlation was noticed early on in seismic tomography, and it was understood almost immediately to be evidence that indeed the mantle is a viscous fluid capable of displacement under the action of these buoyancy forces. I'll explain that in right here. If you have a density anomaly that's rising, from the Earth's interior, it will displace the topography at the Earth's surface upwards. So although the density anomaly reflects a negative density contrast for a hot plume, the excess topography generated at the surface is a positive density anomaly. You have more mass here, which was not present prior to the upward movement of the plume. And so both structures, the topography and the eternal uh, anomaly itself, generate a gravitational contribution to this to the gravity field of the Earth. Now, if the Earth were static, in other words, were not flowing, we would only see the structure of the density anomaly. There would be no dynamic topography generated at the Earth's surface. But because the mantle is capable of flowing and therefore generating dynamic topography, this contribution becomes important and indeed can become larger than the anomaly generated in the Earth's interior the primary anomaly, such that, that if the topography is sufficiently large, its gravitational signal exceeds that of the plume, and we can therefore have a positive gravity anomaly over a mantle upwelling, contrary to what we expect for a rigid or static Earth. And this, of course, explains this anti-correlation. So it's the viscous structure of the mantle that is essential 
in understanding this anti-correlation between the geoid and the density anomalies in the Earth's interior. And that therefore requires us to understand as well as we can, what the viscosity of the mantle is, how does it change with position in particular with depth? And what we see here, for example, is a recent study that was carried out uh, by colleagues um, in California, Rudolph et al. This work was published in a science paper where they uh, used the geoid, the long wavelength geoid to constrain the depth distribution of viscosity shown here by several colored curves, the blue curve, the red curve, um, and the black curve. These are the three curves that these authors derived for showing on the horizontal axis, a logarithm of the viscosity versus depth uh, from the surface right down to the bottom of the core. And on top of it, I've superimposed an earlier analysis from, well, 35 years ago, uh, which was work that I was involved in, in which we tried to find simply the best two layer viscosity structure that also provides a fit to the very same data that these authors um, were fitting in 2015. And what of course will, will strike you if you look at these is that there's an overall remarkably good similarity in terms of a large increase in viscosity near the top of the lower mantle and then possibly further changes which are not well constrained um, occurring deeper in the lower mantle. So the main message is that the geoid indicates that the main viscosity increase in the Earth's interior is not at 670 kilometers depth. This is the famous depth that corresponds to the phase change that separates the upper mantle and the lower mantle. It's understood that it, the geoid requires viscosity increases within the lower mantle, strong, strong increases. And we've taken that one step further in some work that was done with Jerry Mitrovica uh, in 2004 and later on in 2010, where we took all of the data that was available to us in these studies, including post-glacial rebound data, but also all of the mantle convection data. And we inverted that data in a single inversion to come up with one or perhaps more models of the viscosity variation in the mantle with depth. And what we see here uh, is the range of models uh, with the inferred bounds shown in gray, uh, gray, the range of models of the viscosity at different depths that provide a fit, a good fit to all of these data at the same time. And this is actually significant in the sense that glacial isostatic adjustment occurs on time scales of only thousands of years, whereas mantle convection occurs on time scales of millions of years. And there's always been this understanding that the viscosity of the mantle might be intrinsically time dependent, particularly if the viscosity is governed by nonlinear uh, physical phenomena. So if there is time dependence, we should not be able to reconcile the glacial isostatic adjustment data with the long wavelength uh, and long time mantle convection data, but we can. And so this tells us something about the microphysics of the creep processes of the mantle that we're able to reconcile them. And this reconciliation you'll see generates models which show uh, uh, on a logarithmic scale on the horizontal axis, a large increased viscosity from the bottom of the lithosphere right here at the top where in the asthenosphere, where the viscosity increases by three orders of magnitude by the time we reach 2000 kilometers depth, and then followed by a significant de decrease of viscosity as we go towards the core mantle boundary. So once again, we see this inference of large increases of viscosity but particularly within the lower mantle uh, required to fit these data sets, including, of course, and most importantly for us, the geoid or the gravity data. So with these ingredients, viscosity and seismic data to constrain the three-dimensional structure of the Earth, we can then go on to attempt what is called a joint inversion of all of of the seismic data that has been painstakingly compiled by seismologists. In particular, this is the data that has been compiled by colleagues of mine at the University of uh, Texas at Austin, Steve Grand and his tomography group. And most recently, Petar Glishovich has been involved in doing these inversions once again. 
These data provide constraints on the shear wave velocity structure of the mantle at all depths in the mantle. And we can combine this data with geodynamic data, which also provide global constraints on the heterogeneity in the mantle at all depths in the mantle. But the constraints provided by the geodynamic data are independent and complementary to the constraints provided by the seismic data. So I mentioned earlier the concern that we have about gaps or holes in the coverage provided by seismic data. Well, those gaps can be then filled, figuratively speaking, by also introducing these additional constraints, the geodynamic constraints. And in order to combine these two data sets, we require mineral physics. So we need to understand how shear velocity anomalies are related to density anomalies through independent understanding of the mineral physical behavior of the constituents of the mantle from the surface right down to the core. And I cite here uh, some of the mineral physical studies that we've used in deriving the relationship between density anomalies when the geodynamic data is sensitive to the density anomalies. And the seismic data, of course, is sensitive only to the seismic structure. How do we connect the two? Well, through the mineral physics. And then we can then carry out a direct inversion of both constraints to derive three-dimensional models of both the velocity anomalies in the mantle and simultaneously and the density anomalies. So basically, we set up a very large-scale inverse problem where the mineral physics is directly incorporated into that mineral physics. There seems to be, just a second. This is what we find as a consequence of these ge geodynamic joint inversions with seismic data. Here, I'm showing you a particular cross section inside of the earth underneath North America, extending from the surface right down to the core mantle boundary. The model is global, of course, but I'm focusing on the structure under North America, just to show you the kind of detail that is now possible thanks to these joint inversions. What we see in the red colored regions are those parts of the mantle under North America in which the density anomalies are negative. In other words, these correspond to what would be hotter regions and therefore buoyant regions. The blue colored structures represent those parts of the mantle which uh, are denser, therefore colder. And what we see under North America is this immense structure that extends basically from the bottom of the upper mantle here, right down to the core, and we recognize that this structure is actually a fossil tectonic plate. This is the Farion plate, which was subducting off of the west coast of North America until about 30 million years ago. But this subduction occurred over a very long time from essentially the Cretaceous, ended 30 million years ago. And now the structure has moved under North America to where we see it here in this, in this cutout. And this structure generates, as you can see, a flow pattern, which is shown here by these green colored cones. And that flow pattern you can see very clearly is essentially a single convection cell. It's a, almost a classic case of what we would call a Baynard convection cell. You have a cold downwelling limb driving one part of the convection cell and the other part of the convection cell is this hot buoyant upwelling. And so we find that today, North America sits literally squarely up atop of this large scale convection cell underneath. Uh, and that, that convection cell, as you'll see, draws in also material from the Atlantic coming off the plane here of the page, straight underneath eastern part of North America. So this is hot mantle inflow. This is now the kind of detail that we can visualize, as well as the structure in the Earth's interior which we obtain the dynamical structure by basically solving the equations of mantle dynamics. And there are two equations that we need to solve to de determine the dynamics at any one instant. We need to conserve mass everywhere in the mantle, and this is the mass conservation equation. And then we need to conserve momentum. This is Newton's second law. Where what, here we see that the flow in the mantle occurs thanks to these buoyancy forces. 
And the problem of mantle flow is simplified because the viscosity of the rocks in the mantle is so large that the inertial term acceleration is essentially negligible in the mantle. So unlike in the atmosphere, the ocean, or indeed even the core, where this term is very important, in the mantle, our calculations are simplified because the viscosity of the rocks is so great that accelerations are essentially negligible. Now, now those calculations require specification, as I mentioned earlier, of boundary conditions. And these are very important if we're going to construct a model that is capable of reproducing what we observe geologically at the Earth's surface. In the past, a number of boundary conditions have been employed, such as uh, a simple free slip condition or a global no slip condition. Or of course, what's been very popular, particularly for the models that involve time dependent plates at the surface, those plate velocities are simply imposed. This is what we would call the hand of God modeling. Now, of course, neither of these would yield uh, a consistent treatment of the surface motions because those motions involve mechanically complex objects called tectonic plates. And the movements of those tectonic plates, of course, is coupled to the buoyancy forces in the Earth's interior. So we need a treatment where these mechanically stiff objects are coupled viscously to the flow driven in the Earth's interior. And that treatment is an essential part of what we would call a successful mantle flow model. And in all of the calculations that I'll be talking about, the plate motions at the Earth's surface are predicted through this viscous coupling to the buoyancy forces in the interior. So never at any time are the plate motions imposed. So we have no deus ex machina operating inside these mantle flow models. Now, the reason I'm insisting on this point is because it's become very popular to impose plate motions to reconstruct the dynamics of the Earth's interior. It's very attractive indeed. You have geological constraints on what these velocities are, put them as a boundary condition and let the mantle respond. But of course, that's not really what's happening in the earth as, as uh, some of you might appreciate. So how well do these models therefore fit the surface data? And I'm going to just tabulate two different seismic models which have been derived in the last few years. One is a model uh, derived by the Michigan group, Jeroen Ritzema in particular. This model is called S40RTS. And what we've done is we've converted this model to density using mineral physical scaling. And the fits provided by this model using two different viscosity profiles that I showed earlier, geodynamic inferences. Here are the fits to the plate motions provided by this global model, the fits to the free air anomalies. These are variance reductions, the fits to dynamic topography, and the fit to the core mantle boundary electricity, where it's understood that it should be 400 meters. So the fits are modest, they're not perfect. Let's see the fits that we can obtain when we invert seismic and geodynamic data to further constrain the, the three-dimensional structure of the mantle. This is the model called gypsum. This was derived at the University of Texas at Austin some years ago. And now we see that the fits to the geodynamic data have improved consist considerably. Uh, excellent fits to the plate velocities, very good fits to the free air gravity and all these equivalent fits to the dynamic topography, and once again, good fits to the excess ellipticity of the core mantle boundary. So there's been significant progress through these joint inversions in providing the best fit that we can currently obtain to all of these manifestations of the dynamics of the Earth's interior. And that's going to be important because what we're going to consider now is how we can go backwards in time with these models to reconstruct the evolution of the density anomalies in the mantle. And that evolution will then be calibrated by what we can do currently. In other words, the fit at the present day. Now, I mentioned that the fits to the gravity anomalies are very good, but the fit to the geoid is even better. In particular, the long wavelength geoid. At the top, we have the observed gravity anomalies as seen by GRACE data. And in the bottom, we have the gravity anomalies, again, long wavelengths that are predicted by this new model, the model derived from jointly inverting seismic and geodynamic data. And as you can see here, we have really an excellent fit to the long wavelength geodynamics. And this is going to be important, particularly when we try to go backwards in time. So let's remember that mantle convection 
is a, what we would call an initial value problem. And in the case of the Earth's geo, the two key questions that we need to consider when dealing with this initial value structure is what is the 3D, distribu 3D density distribution today? And this is what we'll call the initial value component of the problem. Two, how does that density distribution change backwards in the geologic past? And how do those changes um, alter the geoid? How does the geoid evolve to those changes? And so this is why we need to be certain that the model today, the initial value component of the problem, provides the best possible constraints to the density distribution in the Earth's interior. If the model is not capable of explaining the data properly today, we can question whether the model is relevant at any time in the geologic past. This is an important concern, and that's why we work so hard to make sure that we have the initial value component as constrained as possible. So the time dependence, of course, is given by this famous equation called the conservation of energy, which tells us how the temperature structure of the mantle evolves with time as a result of these processes that you see on the right, in particular advection, thermal diffusion, and in a compressible mantle, we have additional effects which arise when we treat the mantle as a compressible fluid. So once again, the first two equations tell us about the dynamics at any given instant in time. And the third equation tells us how the structure of the mantle evolves with time. Now, how do we take that equation and go backwards in time? Well, we literally do a time reversal of the conservation of energy equation, but that time reversal is thermodynamically and numerically very unstable. Anyone who's ever tried to model thermal diffusion backwards in time will know that that's an intrinsically unstable problem that explodes as you go backwards in time. And so we introduce a mathematical regularization. This is a well-established technique that was actually introduced by French mathematicians in the 1960s, this regularization of the thermal diffusion problem. And with this regularization, we're able to go backwards in time. And this is the technique that's been established through uh, extensive work that was carried out by Petr Glishevich in these papers that were published over the last few years. And this time reverse thermal energy equation allows us to begin from today, move backwards in time using this reversal equation, then use that estimate of the structure in the mantle at some time in the past, move it forward in time, examine the relationship between that forward prediction and our starting condition. There's going to be, a, in the first step, an error between the two, a, dis a discrepancy. We use that discrepancy to iterate for the next step going backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, and backwards. In other words, we iterate many times until we finally converge onto the starting condition. So it's an iterative process involving time reversal going backwards and standard forward convection going, of course, forward in time. And we've done this essentially going back over the past 70 million years of the Earth's, uh, of the evolution of the Earth's interior. And here we have a reconstruction uh, in this, that was shown in this particular study carried out by Glishevich and myself in 2017, where we've reconstructed the evolution of the structure under the Indian Ocean. So what we have here is a cutout along this line that goes from A to A prime, a reconstruction of the thermal structure under the Indian Ocean from 67 or 70 million years ago to the present day. And keep your eyes out on this particular point in the Indian Ocean. This is the reunion hotspot shown right here in the cross section. You'll notice as we go backwards in time, the reconstruction reconstructs essentially a thermal upwelling, a large scale plume, which came up under reunion island at this time. And what we recognized when we did this reconstruction is that we were rebuilding backwards in time, the original plume that erupted 67 million years ago that led to the famous Deccan traps lava flows. This was one of the most spectacular geologic events in the Cenozoic. And the mantle has a memory of that structure in the present days 
that we can then rebuild going backwards in time using this technique, this backward reconstruction technique. And what's important to recognize is the time scale over which this reconstruction is occurring. In other words, we place the Deccan plume under Reunion Island in the correct location at the correct time. So the timing is essential because that then provides confidence that the large scale viscosity structure that we're using is correct or approximately correct in order to get the timing right. So timing is obviously an important issue. You want the anomalies to be reconstructed with the correct time scales in their correct positions. And this uh, reconstruction provides confidence that that seems to be occurring um, as well as could be hoped for. Uh, just a question on the- uh, Yes. Wh where do you place the Deccan? Uh, the the Deccan tra traps today are now on the Western part of India. So the Indian continent, if we were to look at a geographic reconstruction of the earth 70 million years ago, India would have been essentially right over the reunion plume. So India moved northwards from this point where you see the laser pointer very quickly up to where it is today over the last 70 million years. So you, you are, you're mentioning that the plume you are modeling under the round uh, pink dot. This, is, which is the... Is the Deccan, is the Deccan plume. Is that, is that... That's right. That's exactly the, the argument we've made that this reunion hotspot, which is assumed, and I didn't say this, but it's important to say this now, it's assumed to be fixed in its position. Hotspots are assumed to be fixed relative to the underlying mantle. That's the, the standard assumption. And that's why hotspots are used as a reference frame in plate tectonics. So the hotspot, which today is located under uh, Reunion Island, is kept fixed at its present day location. And we look at the evolution of the mantle relative to that fixed location at the Earth's surface. Now, 67 million years ago, Reunion Island was not there. India was located where you see this magenta circle, the west coast of India. And that's why, of course, the Deccan traps today are found, of course, in the western half of the Indian subcontinent. Reunion, of course, emerged afterwards. Does, does that address your question, Jacques? Yes, perfectly, thanks. Okay, thank you. Now let's look at the implications of that time-dependent reconstruction for the geoid. Here we have the present day degree two geoid. I'm only showing the, the quadrupolar part of the geoid uh, given by spherical harmonic degree two. And here we have the reconstructed geoid 14 million years ago uh, this is one sample, rather than showing you all of them, I'll focus on the geoid 40 million years ago. And you can see already, just visually, that the long wavelength geoid has changed over the past 40 million years in a way that's obviously not negligible, as, as we can see just through this visual comparison. Now, why this is important is that these changes in the degree T geoid directly reflect and constrain changes in the Earth's moment of inertia. And that moment of inertia is represented by this famous tensor, this three by three tensor, the components of which describe the moment of inertia matrix. Those components of Earth's moment of inertia tensor are directly dependent on the harmonic coefficients of the degree two geoid. So if we know the degree two geoid, we can directly infer immediately what the components of Earth's moment of inertia is. And if we know what the moment of inertia is and how it changes with time, we can then reconstruct the changes in Earth's angular momentum. Now, what we don't know is how the rotation of the Earth itself had to change as the moment of inertia changed. And to determine what the changes of the rotation are, we apply the principle of conservation of angular momentum to the Earth as a whole. And this is the famous Euler equation uh, in the, under the assumption of no external torques. This is the conservation of angular momentum that the Earth must satisfy as the moment of inertia of the Earth I changes with time, the rotation vector must adjust so as to conserve angular momentum. 
This moment of inertia has multiple contributions as I've shown here. One is the spherical contribution. Uh, this is the moment of inertia of a non-rotating Earth. There's an additional contribution, which is the changes of moment inertia due to changes in the centrifugal potential of the Earth. And finally, and for us, this is the most important, there is a third contribution, which is the change of the moment of inertia due to redistribution of internal mass. That's the mantle convection contribution. So by having all three contributions properly determined as a function of time, we can satisfy this conservation of angular momentum to determine how the rotation vector of the Earth had to change in order to conserve angular momentum. And the change of Earth's rotation axis as a function of time in an Earth-fixed reference frame is what we call true polar wander, or TPW uh, in short. How is true polar wander measured? Well, it turns out that in geomagnetism, and in particular in paleomagnetism, the magnetization of rocks at the Earth's surface, ocean bottom and on continents, contain a, a memory of Earth's magnetic field, and therefore the position of magnetic north as a function of time. And if we assume that the dynamo is aligned with the rotation axis of the Earth. This is the geocentric axial dynamo uh, dipole approximation. If we assume that the geocentric axial dipole approximation is valid as a function of time, the paleomagnetic data provide us therefore information on the changes in the position of the Earth's rotation pole going back in geologic time. And this is exactly what geologists, in this case, Bess and Curtio in Paris, reconstructed the positions of Earth's rotation axis under the assumption of this geocentric axial dipole over the past 200 million years. Now, you'll see that their reconstructed positions shown here by these black dots have significant uncertainties. Uh, these shaded circles around the dots represent the 95% confidence ellipses. And so although this data is clearly important, it's also highly uncertain. And the question that we can explore is whether these paleomagnetic constraints on the positions of Earth's rotation axis are consistent or can be explained by the equivalent changes in the rotation axis that would be predicted by mantle convection. Is there a correspondence between the two? How well do they agree? And if so, what does that agreement tell us about the dynamics in the Earth's interior? And here we show a prediction of the reconstructed position of the rotation axis of the Earth with this particular mantle model. This is a reconstruction going backwards in time using the gypsum model. So each one of these dots along this magenta trajectory is the position of the pole of rotation over the last 70 million years. Each one of these dots, let me zero in, Each one of these dots is spaced 5 million years apart. There is the position of Earth's rotation pole today. So we're going backwards in time as we go along this trajectory. Superimposed on this are two reconstructions of the paleomagnetic position of the pole as given by Bess and Curtio in 2002, and more recently by Torsvik and colleagues. Don't forget, we have uncertainties around each one of these paleomagnetic estimates. What we find, and this is interesting, is that from 70 million years ago till about 50 million years ago, we have this trend in the, in the movement of Earth's rotation axis. Then something special happened 50 million years ago, and basically the trend reversed. It's as though the, the pole uh, did a U-turn and moved back. And in fact, finally, trended to where we see the rotation axis to today. So something happened 50 million years ago that we're investigating in the Earth's interior to cause this hairpin turn in the trajectory of the Earth's rotation axis. And that's in fact shown in the paleomagnetic constraints, both by Bess and by Torsvik, starting at 70 million years ago here, as we move forward in time to 50 million years ago, we have this trajectory, which which then reverses, and we have then this trajectory trend towards present day. So the hairpin turn also in the paleomagnetic data is approximately at the same time as we predict by the mantle convection models. 
this interesting U-turn in the movement of the pole. So this obviously requires an important geodynamic change in the structure in the Earth's interior about 50 million years ago. And both the paleomagnetic data and the mantle convection model capture that change. And when we take into account the uncertainties in the magnetic constraints on pole position and do a chi-square estimate of the fit between the prediction and the measured positions as determined by paleomagnetism, we get a chi-square misfit over the past 70 million years of almost one. So in other words, we fit the paleomagnetic data to within the confidence intervals associated with that magnetic data. This is very important because it's telling us that the reconstruction of Earth's moment of inertia as given by these mantle convection models is approximately correct. And therefore, we can start to pay attention to some of these details, for example, what happened at 50 million years ago. But what's also important is that the very same re reconstruction of the moment of inertia also provides information on changes in the dynamic ellipticity of the Earth. So once again, as the Earth's geoid evolves from the past to the present, this aspect of the moment of inertia, C, B, and A are the principal moment of inertia. Those principal moments of inertia change from the past to the present. And as they change, this quantity called the dynamic ellipticity of the Earth is also changing and can be predicted using the very same model. Why is the dynamic ellipticity important? Well, in this simplified treatment of Earth's rotational dynamics, we recognize that this dynamic ellipticity determines the strength with which the Earth precesses around the pole of the ecliptic due to torques exerted in this case by the sun and moon. So the amplitude of that dynamic ellipticity controls the precession rate and the evolution of Earth's obliquity as a function of time. And of course, these two orbital parameters are key to understanding, uh, of course, the Milankovitch cycles, the famous Milankovitch cycles that are understood to be the origin of the Ice Age cycles on our planet. So once again, we can reconstruct then this dynamic ellipticity using precisely the same information that was used to construct the moment of inertia that was now calibrated in this comparison of true polar wander versus paleomagnetic constraints. So we see that an understanding of dynamic ellipticity hinges in an important way on true polar wonder. If we can model true polar wonder correctly, then we have confidence that we can correctly reconstruct changes in the dynamic ellipticity because both aspects depend on the degree two geoid, both. So how much has the dynamic ellipticity changed over the last 70 million years on the basis of these reconstructions? And I'm showing you here a suite of model predictions using in black and blue, the results obtained with the gypsum tomography model. And in red, the independently determined pure seismic tomography model by Ritzema S40 RTS. And the horizontal axis is time. The vertical axis is relative changes in moment of inertia multiplied by a thousand. So these are changes per mil. Of the, dynamic, not of the dynamic ellipticity. And we see from 70 million years ago going to about 30 million years ago, we have a nearly 1% change in the dynamic ellipticity of our planet. And then this much more modest change over the last 30 million years, an initial decrease such that over the last 20 or so million years, the changes in the dynamic ellipticity are almost insignificantly small. So the most of the change occurs prior to about 20 million years ago. So the question that this raises, and it's an open question, and this is therefore work in progress. This is work that I would like to explore with uh, our host today, Jacques Lascar, is to investigate the implications of these changes in the dynamic ellipticity on precession and obliquity using the many body orbital solutions that, for example, Lasker derived in 1993 and subsequently updated. Now, the reason why this exercise will be important, and just as a teaser to conclude the discussion, is that we know 
that the precession frequency, the natural precession frequency associated with lunar solar forcing is about 25,678 years. Now the next largest natural frequency of forcing due to the planetary positions is associated with what's called a frequency associated with a perihelion of Saturn and Jupiter and the ascending node of Saturn. This additional forcing has a frequency which is almost the same as the natural frequency, the natural precession frequency. So the question is, can we perturb this frequency through changes in H <laughs> such that the lunar solar precession frequency is bought, brought close to this next largest frequency. In other words, the forcing is associated with Saturn and Jupiter. If that were to occur, if we were to come close to this additional forcing, then we would have a resonant enhancement in the evolution of obliquity and precession on our planet. So this is the question that remains to be answered and hopefully will be looked at going ahead when we include this kind of information in the most recent um, many body orbital solutions of, of Alaska and colleagues in Paris. So with that, with that teaser, I would like them to conclude this presentation and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Alessandro. That, that was a very, very nice uh, review and uh, very, <laughs> present very nice new results. So, so I'm quite pleased. It's, uh, it's one of the clearest presentation I've seen <laughs> on the subject. So thanks for the effort. And uh, the, the discussion is open now. Yeah, also thanks for myself for the really uh, interesting talk. Could you go back to a couple of slides? Um, you had one slide where you put the polymagnetic polar wonder and the um, reconstructions from mental dynamics. This so, one? yes, exactly. So, what you're plotting here, did I understand that correct? That this is the rotation axis of the Earth, which had yes. different position? Yes. This is really, really amazing, um, I think. And uh, Linda, I don't know, maybe there's something you can also think about possibly the climate history may be largely driven by how how close that rotation axis actually to the land mass of greenland or not that's yes. something i think no one really looked at but yes, which may explain which may explain a lot that hasn't been explained so far i don't know linda i'd really love to get your opinion on that as well actually is it a question for alessandro or a question for linda um, so, question for Linda is on her opinion, how much of this rotation axis change in direction, in the direction of Greenland can be seen or can influence the climate evolution of the Cenozoic, where we basically see a cooling trend over the last 50 million years? Uh, well, uh, you know, at the same time, we see, you know, the development of ice in the northern hemisphere, well, in, in, by, you know, ice first actually in the southern hemisphere, which would be, uh, you know, the complementary uh, uh, side of the rotation axis. So uh, maybe this explains, well, it, it, that, and the ice actually began to uh, expand dramatically at about 40 million years ago. So uh, it's, I wonder if you can ascribe the, you know, the uh, Antarctic ice sheet growth uh, to this change as well, uh, you know, earlier. And then, you know, as this, you know, starts to move. But, and so, so my question then would become, uh, you know, with the growth of ice in the polar regions, how does that influence the position of the rotation axis? <laughs> That's an excellent question. That's the elephant in the room that hasn't been dealt with here, Linda. The, in other words, obviously the ice sheets themselves are going to deform the Earth, and they're going to therefore induce additional changes to the moment of inertia. And the question is, what are those additional changes on top of what are predicted just by the dynamics inside of the Earth? So we have dynamics at the surface and inside. 
I am not able to quantify the dynamical changes associated with ice sheet deformation of the Earth over the last 70 million years, but that could potentially be dealt with. I mean, there are estimates of the mass of ice and its approximate position over 70 million years. If we were essentially to solve post-glacial rebound over 70 million years, we could actually reconstruct those additional contributions. It's not an impossible problem, but it would require uh, at least an estimate. And right now I don't have the means to establish that estimate. Yeah, but I, and I can state on that, that this is precisely um, what has been the subject of the, the work of Muhammad and uh, in our group in his PhD. And there is a, we have a paper on, uh, it's on archive on that. And maybe Muhammad <laughs> could make a presentation sometime here. And, uh, but it's true that to get the full story, you basically need three ingredients. You need, uh, because you, you have three main components that uh, affect, some affect the, the spin axis, which are the mantle convection, which is just presented by Alessandro. The other one, as he just said, is the deformation and change of mass load due to ice age, load of the ice and the response of the earth to the load of the ice. This. In this recent work, we have the, the work of uh, Muhammad in this, uh, which is in this archive yes. paper you can find. And there is a third component, which is very important, which is also the, the tidal dissipation, which change the spin, but it's changed the spin in a, in a relatively, um, there is still uh, some axisymmetry in this case. So it will not change the, the location of the spin. And so these are the three components which we are we are looking to all of them at present. And uh, so so for the, the, the this uh, big work of Alessandro, uh, I like it because it addresses this component which we in our group we don't we don't uh, do it. We rely on the work of Alessandro, and we we talk of that several years ago when we establish our project. So. So, the, but the three components have to be put together to get to really get the full picture, which we have not done yet completely. So that, and I hope that will be done very soon. Yes, Linda. I just wanted to add that. Uh, yeah. So the other component is, you know, the the effect on the spin rate of of the pole of the rotation pole. And uh, so hopefully cyclostratigraphy can uh, help put some constraints on that if we could get good data. Yes. Uh, we're still struggling with the data, but, uh, but uh, anyway, so that, that's an, another observational dimension that you could add in at, maybe at the very end. <laughs> yes. any, any other, but we are, we are speaking here of uh, relatively recent time, I would say, the relatively, uh, the, the, the recent uh, 70 million years, which is already a lot, but it, it's for having um, discriminating uh, cyclostratigraphic data of this time, it's not so easy. Um, any other question? One, one question I have is about uh, time reversal, because, I understand now that uh, all the fit is done, yes, with this picture, just this picture here. Um, you need, basically, you had to get the solution right, you use, you assume that your equation are time reversible and you mm -hmm. integrate forward and backward. Yes. And uh, try to match the, the the backward condition, the backward to the initial condition, to the starting condition. Right here, yes. Is, so my question is, uh, how long could you go with that? Because it will not be time reversible of a, it will be only of a limited time after you will not be able to do that. Yes, this is something that, I don't know if Peter is here, um, 
if he wants to jump in at this point, because he's been looking at this in detail. Um, Peter, are you there? Yeah, you'll have to unmute yourself. Did you, did you yeah. hear Jacques' question? Yeah, yeah, I hear, I hear his question. Yes. Um, actually, right now we did uh, uh, only uh, only over reconstructions only over Cenozoic era because <laughs> you know it, there there are some constraints on this this kind of model because as 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 Alessandro mentioned, we are we are using the plate uh, reconstructions. So play boundary reconstructions as we go all over 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 time, and 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 actually as we know there is some limitation in those reconstruction you know because as as I remember from Dave Rowley paper uh, after after like uh, 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 there involves some extrapolation in yes. in determining play boundaries and play velocities. So, so we are not sure how re, re, reliable are those those reconstructions. So we are sure that around 70 MA we have pretty pretty good reconstruction of play boundaries and play plate velocities. So if you, you you know theoretically we can we can as as far as we know those plate boundaries and play uh, uh, plate velocities we can we can go backward in time, but at the same time. Uh, you know, there are some, you know, initial conditions like uh, unknown in like those those numerical errors that we accumulate. So uh, I, I would say, you know, between 70 and 100 million years, uh, we can we can be like sure that this model uh, work works very well. But after that, we have to do some additional testing and 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 to know exactly how far. We can go in, in 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 the in the geological past, but I would say uh, the limitations are like between seventy and a hundred million years ago. Okay, right that's, what, that's what I remember. Okay, thank you, Peter. That's that's exactly what I remember. So, I think a hundred million years, if we go further back, given the uncertainties and tectonic reconstructions, as Peter said, which are quite large at this point, we lose an important verification tool at the Earth's surface, which are the plates and where they're moving. Uh, that's We use that as a verification tool of our reconstructions. Do, do our, do, does the flow <laughs> concord with the reconstructed plate motions? And if we don't have that verification available to us, so it's highly uncertain, then we're limited a little bit. But uh, in the interest of what we would call hypothesis testing, uh, we're nonetheless going to do sort of go into uncharted territory and go even further back in time. But at that point, I would say the models are more in the, should be considered under the light of hypothesis testing if we go further back in time to explore scenarios rather than to necessarily reconstruct the actual evolution of the Earth. Yeah, uh, on the uh, on the same point, I have a question about when you about what you mean by fit. What, what are the parameters, what, what are the observables that you fit? What, what are the parameters that you fit? Well, we have parameters we need to fit at time zero, which are all the geodynamic data which we have at time zero, which are- yeah. uh, So you have, you have two things kind of thing. You have the initial condition. So this is what you are mentioning. The, yes. the dynamical variable, which you need to fit. Yeah. And, uh, and do you have some parameters in addition to that that you fit? Um, for the present day? Well, the, essentially we need to explain the seismic data today with the models that we use. That's the tomographic inverse problem. The models have to explain geodynamic constraints on the density distribution in the mantle at time zero. Going backwards in time at each of these moments in the past, we have paleomagnetic reconstructions of plate motions. That is the only backward in time geodynamic observable constraint that we have going backwards in time, yeah. the plate that, motions. That's the observable, but what are the parameters of your model? Oh, the uh, input parameters, yes. you mean. Oh, I see. Well, we have viscosity, the viscosity distribution, 
Uh, when you mean the viscosity, do you mean the viscosity profile or do you mean how many, I want to know how many parameters you have, how many? Uh, it's the viscosity profile. We use a 25 layer viscosity profile. We have then the so mechanical. This, so this is a lot of, uh, so it's a 25, 25 parameter basically. Yes. Um, Plus, yes, for the plus the size of the layers, of course. So it's a 50 parameter. That's right. Yeah. And we have thermal conductivity, coefficient of thermal expansion. So this coefficient of thermal conductivity, it's for the wall, it's one parameter or it's uh, one per layer? It's, it's, it's a depth dependent parameter as well. It varies with depth. No, so it's a function as well. That's it's right. Like, it's a function. Thermal, yes, thermal expansion is also a function of depth in our models. It's not a constant. Mm -hmm. So uh, even the Earth's gravity field, of course, it changes with depth uh, according and to the density of the Earth's it, interior. When you model it in your program, do you take one value per layer as with uh, as for yes. the viscosity? If, if, if effectively we have one value for each depth layer. Um, although in the case of thermal conductivity and thermal expansion, we actually use continuous functions to describe them as a function of depth. Okay. So they're continuous functions of depth. So these are thermodynamic parameters that are key to reconstructing the temperature of the Earth's interior. And we have to also assume that we know those. And that's where then mineral physics data we have to, this is why the problem is so multidisciplinary. We have to put on the hat of a mineral physicist, look at all the results that the mineral physicists have established over the last 20 years and incorporate those results in this modeling. It's, it's really quite an enterprise. It's quite an effort to do this right. And, and uh, we can't claim to be necessarily perfect at having digested all of the mineral physics data. There's no doubt that maybe the thermal conductivity we're using might need to be modified in future modeling. There's new, in fact, there's new work coming out telling us how thermal conductivity in the deep mantle might need to be revised relative to what we thought it was even 10 years ago. So again, this is work in progress that will be also part of the work. And uh, how critical is the number of layers? Uh, well, it, had, it should be not too small because otherwise you're not reproducing. In the case of viscosity, it's been very popular to use two layer models. For example, in post glacial rebound, uh, you're you familiar with a lot of papers where just two layers of viscosity are used to do post glacial rebound modeling. That's too simple. And, it, and in fact, it's led to some serious controversies in the field over what we call the Haskell constraint on viscosity, where that was badly misinterpreted because of the use of two layer viscosity models. Um, so we need to have enough layers to capture the mineral physical estimate of how viscosity should change with depth. So we really also know that mineral physics predicts that viscosity should change continuously with depth and the layers we introduce should be consistent with those expected changes in viscosity as estimated from mineral physics. Uh, and two or four layers is not enough, it's too simple. Uh, I, if you wanted just to say a, a, a rule of thumb, if it's less than 10 layers, I think it might be difficult to justify even from mineral physics, those depth variations. Okay. So, uh, Jack, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Alessandro, I have a question on that. Just uh, so, uh, do you include chemical composition in the in your models, or only uh, density heterogeneities are included? The density heterogeneities in the tom in the in the joint tomography model, in this one, for example, has included within thermochemical heterogeneity 
homogeneity right here at the bottom of the mantle. Yeah. So there are there are parts of the density structure here that have a chemical origin, not just a thermal origin. Because it would, and that's it. Because it, I, in my understanding, it would be very significant, especially at the lower part of the mantle, right? It, in the lower 400 kilometers of the mantle, yes, there's a significant amount of, of thermal chemical heterogeneity, and that's also built into these models. Okay. Yes. Okay, just a, another simple question. I was wondering if you made an experiment because you said that um, the plate tectonics are included as a constraint to your uh, a model. So yes. did you make any experiment without taking plate tectonics as a constraint in your iterative method and then letting the system evolve and see what happens? Yes, we have. And we actually find in some cases, we disagree with the paleomagnetic reconstructions of plate motions at, ah. some, key, at some key times. Uh, there's something strange going on with plate tectonics 40 million years ago. And when we let the models run from the past to the present without satisfying those observed constraints, we find near 40 million years ago, we start to defer or diverge from yeah. the paleomagnetic reconstructions. So something interesting is happening in plate tectonics 40 million years ago that might not be fully captured in the current paleomagnetic reconstructions. Yes. Oh, I see somebody raising their hand. Sorry, Linda. Yeah. Linda. Yeah. I, I was actually going to continue. I, I wasn't going to uh, talk about your uh, this current discussion exactly, but uh, I noticed in the viscosity models that you have, you still do have a nice uh, uh, decreased viscosity at 600 kilometers. Oh, yes. Yes, that's so, an important aspect of the right. model. And so is that an important aspect for uh, for loading? It is, and particularly for the, it turns out that the degree two geoid is very sensitive to the presence of that rheological layer. Yes. Quite sensitive. Um, and we've we've noted even in the modeling of post glacial rebound, it's sensitive to the presence of that layer at the bottom of the upper mantle when that's included even in post glacial rebound models. So it seems to play a key role, and there's a lot of mineral physical argumentation that's been proposed over the last few years why that layer should be there. Some argue in terms of hydration uh, reactions at the bottom of the upper mantle associated with the phase phase change, where essentially the minerals in that layer are exceptionally hydrated and therefore weaker. Um, it's even said that the equivalent of one or two oceans worth of water might be stored at the bottom of the transition zone. Uh, that hydration and the weakening could be reflected in that low viscosity, in fact. Uh, Alessandro, I have another question. Yes. Uh, so for this slide specifically, what kind of viscosity model do you use? We use that one, with the, what we call the V1 model, which has the low viscosity. Oh, no, this one is, let me go back to the top and show you. It's V2. It's, ah, thank you, Peter. It's V2, and I'll, let me show you the V2 model. It's this model right here. V2 is Mitrovicen 40, 2004, right? No, V1 is Mitrovicen 4 to 2004. This is a further a, a modification in 2010, V2. Okay, okay, okay. And the difference between the two is right here. V1 has the low viscosity layer, V2 has that removed. Why? I got a lot of complaints when I published this model with Jerry. People said, that layer, we don't like that layer at the yeah. bottom. And, I, and they asked me, said, can you derive a model which doesn't have that layer? We don't like it. Actually, Torsten Becker came up to me one day and said, I don't like your model. I don't like that low. Can you find a model that doesn't have the layer? And I said, OK, Torsten, we'll go back to the drawing board. And so we derived another model, which we call V2, without the low viscosity layer. It does approximately a, a reasonably good job of fitting the data, but not as well as V1. V1 definitely. I fits the in particular the geoid better than V2. Okay. Uh, but because there have been so many complaints in the field about this softening here, yeah. we also said, okay, if you want, we'll show you results for V2 as well, as well as V1. We have that, both. Does that evolve with time? Uh, the, uh, for uh, sure. As 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 the mean as the geotherm of the mantle changes with time. 
the viscosity should change with the geotherm. Yeah. But over 70 million years, the geotherm change is very small. It, the changes are basically insignificant. For the geotherm to change significantly, you need to integrate over hundreds of millions of okay. years. Okay. And, that's when, and that's when the viscosity will change in important ways. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you go back then uh, to the last slide? So yes, yeah, so these, uh, these are the evolution of the dynamical electricity. And uh, yes. there is a significant difference between the V1 models and the V2 model. Is oh, it, yes. Is it due to only, is it essentially due to this additional layer in the V1? It could be due to that. It's also due to the time scale over which the buoyancy changes. The time scale will be different with V2 relative to V1. It could also, and actually because this is degree two geoid, it's possible, and I haven't checked this, that that low viscosity layer is the primary difference between the prediction here and the prediction here. And that's something that I can't, I can't give you an answer. I'd have to check that and go back into the calculation. Yeah, because you, because it's, yeah, it looks very, at least in this plot, you. The, the two uh, the two v1 model of uh, sure the the and, largest changes yeah largest yeah. changes at the beginning yes and uh, from all of these which one you would you trust the most well based on the fit to based on this um v1 Oh, you would based on this V1. V1, based on that V1, and therefore I would focus, given that the calibration to true polar wonder, I would focus on these two curves. Okay. One which one which explicitly matches the plate tectonic reconstructions. This one with the M, and one which doesn't is not obligated to match the plate tectonic reconstructions. Both provide similar notice changes in the dynamic ellipticity. So it's it's really V1, it's this viscosity uh, that is ultimately important. And, uh, and it's true that here, if there was some uh, precise cyclostratigraphic data, uh, and if we can disentangle all the other effects, uh, it would be quite interesting to see at least in which direction we go because yes. it, there is quite a difference now. Uh, it's uh, eight, uh, nearly 1% difference between the, uh, the V1 uh, model and the blue model, the V2 model. Yep. Okay, so. I, I would use all of these to test whether we can, can distinguish through the cyclostratigraphic data yeah. The predictions obtained with these different scenarios. I mean, that would be a so, beautiful yeah, thing so, to So basically, testing. we have to yeah. know whether at 30, 40 million years, we are above present or below present. That's basically yes. the, the yes. idea. But, uh, but to have that, we have also to, to remove the main, the main effect, I remind uh, to everybody, will be the tidal dissipation. Yes. So, right. so it's not right. uh, it's not an easy task because everything has to be removed, tidal dissipation and and uh, ice load, ice load, oh. ice load is not that big. So uh, if it is nearly eight per thousand, it should be above ice load, but tidal dissipation is big. So, but uh, I wanted to ask you about tidal dissipation, Jacques. Are you suggesting that we don't understand it well enough over 70 million years, or do we understand it? Well, we, we, have, uh, we understand it somewhat. We understand it. So we have, um, there are some parameters that are missing that are, you know, the, the main parameter in, uh, in the evolution of tidal dissipation is, uh, is the rheology of the Earth, again. So we have to, to use it and we have to, it's difficult to infer, you, we, we, you need to make some physical assumption to infer this rheology and uh, how this rheology change. But uh, all, 
And this rheology does, you see, because the problem of the rheology of the Earth is that it is um, mostly a large part come from the oceanic tide. So it's due to, and it's due to uh, effects that, and that's really the, the, the present work of Mohammed that, uh, which also we have some problem with the journal, but uh, this is, um, it, it's, uh, it's not an easy problem. So. What about, yeah. cons what about constraints from corals on length of day? Yeah, uh, are, but, are, okay, are the... For, forget about corals and all these kind of things. But there are some, there are some cyclostratigraphic data that are, uh, that could be reliable for that as well. And um, you have to put all this together, basically. This is uh, what we, but you cannot rely on single observation. You cannot rely or there are lots, <laughs> you know, the problem is uh, people who are making observation, they, they, it's, they are the, the geological observation. You mentioned coral and uh, bivalve and whatever you want. Yes. All this is highly, highly um, uncertain. And basically people, they publish their data when it fits the theoretical curve. So, <laughs> so you see, it's, it's not so easy. We are, but, but this is what we are looking for. We are, yeah. and, uh, and all this together. And I think we are, we'll be, we, we are progressing. So we have uh, all these, uh, all these elements to take into account. I think uh, Linda should jump in and defend the people who look at data. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that Linda will comment on that, of course, but she, yes. I'm quite sure she will. She knows the data. And I think that the more you know the data, the more you are frightened by the, <laughs> by the conclusion you could make out of them. No, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, I, I, at this point, there, there are some potential uh data from bivalves for the cretaceous that one could potentially look at uh but it's highly uncertain and really the better data are the cyclostratigraphic data but given that it's it's a very uh challenging process to try to back out uh you know the precession rate of the earth that, that's where all of the uh all of the parameters that you're interested in here will will be in the precession rate, and uh, the data are very difficult to tune, so to speak. You to get the the original time scale the, uh, is very difficult to do. Uh, so you know something like the iterative process that you were looking at uh, sort of uh, it seems attractive in a way. I, I'm not sure how, but uh, maybe that's maybe some sort of you know, back and forth, you know, you know, iterations might be a way to, to solve this problem. But anyway, so, so finding exactly the, the best possible cyclostratigraphic sequences, and there are some candidates, um, it seems like the best, the best data that we can, we can work with at this moment. Are, are these bivalves globally distributed or just in certain localities? Well, the bivalves, of course, are in, in, in marine environment, shallow marine environments. Um, the, I'm thinking of one bivalve, <laughs> one bivalve <laughs> that was analyzed a, a few years ago uh, from the late, uh, the late Cretaceous um, campaign. So about, about 70 million years ago mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a bivalve that is today extinct. In fact, it went extinct, completely the rudest. It went extinct, you know, around 70 million years ago. So we actually don't know for sure what its growth, uh, you know, growth dynamics was. So, you know, looking inside at, you know, a micron thick layering and assuming that they're daily is, is somewhat of a, it's, it's, it's somewhat, <laughs> it's speculative. So, so we don't really know. And then, then of course, we had bivalves that responded to tidal uh, variations, you know, diurnal, sub, sub diurnal uh, tidal variations. Those might 
be able to be used, but they're quite short. Uh, not really sure how good they are, although they do exist, you know, for the, um, s some studies have gone forward in time up to the Miocene to try to estimate uh, length of day from, from these specimens. So uh, that's something that, you know, I'm hoping to look at, <clears throat> you know, just go back and look at it again. But really the, the, the vast majority of good data that has had a lot of attention and a lot of, uh, you know, careful consideration of how to collect it is really in the cyclostratigraphic data, in my opinion. Um, I, any other? Yes, you have a comment, uh, Christian. Just saying, saying that you agree with Linda on the yes, I, I somewhat agree as well. That uh, from what I've seen, and uh, and and that also the, the good thing about psychographic data is that uh, these data are collected in a relatively. Uh, well-defined way and could be examined by several teams and that makes a big difference. Uh, it gives a lot of uh, much more robustness to the results. Um, the problem with all these data that are, co that are <laughs> collected about bivalve, about uh, tidal rhythmite and things like that, very often, you know, it's a uh, it's uh, some, some data in a very specific location examined only by one team. And if another team examines the same data, he gets some different results. So that's, uh, that's about it, uh, say that's the problem. Um, I have another, it doesn't mean that you need to throw everything to the trash, huh? that is, but the problem is that there, you, you, it's, it's very difficult to a priori distinguish the good data from the bad data. Um, I have a question. You're, you're, okay, here you, the curve is of uh, 70 million years. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, if you prolong it further, it will be more speculative. Yes. But there is still something which is interesting is uh, what is the full extension of this? Because it's not something that yes. will keep going. It is, no. uh, it is limited. So no. what is we, uh, in this? We, uh, we can see that even here, for example, the trend then starts to flatten for some of these models. Exactly. Yeah. You so, can see so, that here. With the, so that was my question about uh, if you look over 200 million years, what will be the maximum extent of this? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that's something that we'll have to look at in future modeling going further back in time. So because the that, evidence seen from these simulations, the blue and red ones seem to indicate uh, an approximate bottoming of the change at around 60 million years ago. But we don't know if we were to take these models further back where there might be other changes that have, are undocumented here. So again, uh, we can only speculate and I don't want to speculate more than, than needed considering we haven't done the modeling yet. Yeah, because that's uh, that's an important uh, result to get also yes. to, to know what is the yes. limit limitation of the extent of this variation. Yes. yes. May, may, may I just add? Yes, go ahead, Peter. So let's say just theoretically, we didn't, as, as Alessandro said, we have to do that like practical testing. We did, for example, for, for using the uh, plate tectonics, was trained over 70 million years, but we also did some, uh, I would say theoretical simulation using uh, rigid surface conditions, like one plate uh, surface. And, and we extended this modeling uh, up to 125 million years. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that, those are things that we did until now. But uh, uh, there are plans to use like uh, plate reconstructions that cover last 250 million years. So, you know, theoretically, this, this modeling te technique allows us to, to go uh, and reconstruct mental, mental 
structure uh, to, 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 I would say, deep past, like 250 million years. Yeah. And in that case, we could go back to the true polar wonder estimates from paleomagnetism. And once again, ask the question, to what extent can we explain them? If we explain them the way we've done uh, in this current limited modeling, then we're really on a very good track because I think it should also make people in paleomagnetism happy because there's been a lot of debate in their community as to whether the rotation pole is identifiably different from where it is today at any time in the past, considering the uncertainties. Um, it's been argued in some quarters, in particular by my colleague in Chicago, Dave Rowley, who said, well, when you think about the uncertainties, we might say that the rotation pole hasn't moved at all within the errors provided by, by paleomagnetism. So, so, I mean, that's an important uh, message to keep in mind because in some sense, we're also going to embark on some sort of interesting intellectual exchange with the people in paleomagnetism as to what their data are truly showing us, what is the signal that is actually present in that data and what's noise. Uh, we can start to tease that out with this kind of modeling. So it, it, it encompasses actually some interesting questions that go just beyond just the treatment of dynamic ellipticity. That's, that's what makes this kind of modeling so much fun is that we're straddling multiple fields when we, when we look at this. Also more dangerous. <laughs> okay, any... Other comment, question? Thank you, Alessandro. It was Thank wonderful you, Linda. Talk. It was, I, was, I was glad you were able to join us. Thank you for those great comments as well. Thank you, Christian, as well. And, and everyone else who showed up. I, I, I only have a limited view of the screen, so I may thank everybody for coming today as well. Yeah. And, for, and thank you, Jacques, for organizing this. It's really a great, a great opportunity. Yeah, and uh, as I said, it will be put on the on the AstroGeo channel on the. Oh, I see. Okay, um, very good. Uh, there will be uh, the problem is when you say that people sometimes they think, oh, it's okay. I will watch it after on the. I will watch it after <laughs> on YouTube, so and uh, they don't make the effort if they if they could to to be uh, in life, but. Uh, yes. But that's uh, but on the other yes. hand. Uh, I think it makes now a collection that people are happy to, to look at. Oh, it's um, not a valuable archive. Yeah, very valuable. I think that for, yeah, for, for building a community around all this problem, as it is very pluridisciplinary to have in a place everything that is uh, related to the problem by, uh, and up to now we had, including yours, we had quite good conference. And uh, I'm quite happy with uh, with the with the output. I hope, uh, and there are about hundred views, you know. Uh, aside from the, of course, we are not looking for million of views. We we are not looking for we are not looking for a big audience. It's not the problem. It's just to have a place where things are put and people who are interested, who want to join the community, who want students who are new in the field can go there and have uh, very rapidly uh, an overview of, the, of what's going on. Okay. Miles, do you have any comment? I see you are, are you here or do you on the, on the talk? Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> no, 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 I, uh, I uh, really appreciated the, 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 the talk. It was super clear as everybody said, so, so yeah. A big uh, bravo. <laughs> Merci, my <dear. laughs> Okay, so so we will stop here, and uh, and the next talk will be on the hundred thousand uh, year cycle, and it's uh, some uh, biological uh, origin.